I dream of the future. It's what I love doing. It's why I became a physicist. I wanted to know, based on the laws of physics, what is possible down the road. It's also why I write science fiction, to use that knowledge to influence and imagine what may come to be, to ensure not just that a future exists, but it's one that works for everyone. Science is the greatest predictor of what the future may be like. In the past, scientific revolutions have been the driving force of civilization, and there's nothing more disruptive than a revolution. Yet when we accept this disruption, instead of hesitating in a moment of change, technological growth and innovation is possible. Humanity drives revolutions, and negative disruption ensues from poor science communication and the lack of storytelling. Because when scientists tell effective stories, they help societies prepare for those revolutions of the future, which decreases that negative disruption and increases progress. Storytelling is universal. It's what makes us different than other mammals. We use language to communicate what's going on inside of our brains to other brains through stories. And everything boils down to stories. And science is no different. It's just another form of storytelling, one with a method. It's iterative, air-reducing, testable, explanatory, and most importantly, predictive. Scientific revolutions are rare, the last ones being over 100 years ago, and we're still living in the spoils of them today, one of those being quantum mechanics, and with that came the computer revolution. Scientific revolutions are also paradigm-shifting because they require humanity to reconsider deeply held beliefs and ideas. This can be both difficult and disruptive. And we all know that change can be uncomfortable, but sometimes it's so uncomfortable that we resist it altogether. Climate change is a case in point. While science has proven beyond a doubt that climate change is a quickly growing problem in our world, we're still debating whether or not it's real instead of working together towards solutions. And herein lies my concern. In order to continue moving forward as a civilization, we must be willing to rethink old ideas and stories in order to make way for the new. The problem is, scientists aren't always the best storytellers. We like long explanations, technical jargon, and math, <laughs> many of which are inaccessible to the general public. And studies have even shown that throwing more facts at people doesn't help change their mind, nice catch, or learn. Even while writing this talk, I had a difficult time trying to explain the science that was both revolutionary and understandable to my audience. But when scientists tell bad stories, the public receives bad information, and societies make bad decisions. The relationship between all of them become fractured, and disruption, instead of being revolutionary, ends up causing harm and stagnation. Think of all the bad stories surrounding vaccinations, climate change, or artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, scientists didn't do the best job explaining the science behind these technologies, and now we're paying the price with massive amounts of resistance. So as a scientist, let me practice what I preach. I want to tell you a science story of tomorrow. In order to do this, we all need to have open minds. We need to be able to consider how reality is now and what it could be like in the future. This may be uncomfortable to you, but, but, dis, but, tr, but, but, sorry, I'll be honest. This may feel uncomfortable to you, but that's okay. Good science communication, along with good storytelling, may make us uncomfortable. But in the end, it's in that discomfort where true growth happens. So, let's set up the story a little bit, shall we? A little world building for my science fiction friends. In the last five decades, technology has been driven by something called Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the reason why computers went from being laboratory size into something that fits inside your pocket. It is the driver and Promethean fire of our information age. So what is it? Well, Moore's Law is all about the effects of making something called the transistor smaller. Moore's Law shows that by shrinking the dimensions of these transistors, we not only double the number we can put on a computer chip every two years, but it also reduces its cost while increasing its speed, memory. The world we experience today is a result of this law. But Moore's Law is predicted to end in the next decade or so, around 2030, 2035. And this means that we'll be reaching a limit to how small we can make these devices at a specific cost. 
And this is going to have drastic effects on both our economy and our technology. But with the end of one thing comes the beginning of another. And this another will be a new type of device to replace the transistor, one that mimics the behavior of neurons. This device will utilize that nano size that Moore's Law gave us, but add in new properties of parallel interconnections, self-assembly, and new forms of memory. A device that can connect and merge the inorganic world of silicon with the organic world of our brains. Imagine a neural-like transistor that's smarter, faster, and more durable. A brain 2.0. Now, what kind of world could these new types of brains create? Well, to answer that, we need to peer a little bit over the horizon. We need to go to the future. It's the year 2100. Moore's Law ended all a half century ago. And with it came the birth of a new technological revolution, one guided by an exponential interconnectivity law. Now, let's imagine that scientists do a poor job communicating the science behind this new technology, as they sometimes have in the past. The future may be bleak. We don't understand the power of this science, so we use it unethically. Things like programmable nanomagnets are placed inside of our brains, and intertranscranial magnetic stimulation is used to control our thoughts. Governments and corporations project virtual propaganda right into our heads, both fully monitoring and controlling our ideas, thoughts, and behaviors. A true Orwellian nightmare. Or, scientists tell the right story. They tell the story about how this innovation can help us. They both explain how it works and its advantages. Now, in the year 2100, we may meet Annie, a PhD student who works, to help, who works on traumatic brain injuries. On her way to work, she calls her mother from an augmented Skype-like reality called iThink. At work, she turns on her neuro neuromorphic computer and interacts with the holographic apps. And there, she can see her plans for the day. Today, she'll be using an, an organic memristor type technology to repair motor cortex neurons of a stroke victim. Kind of like a skin graft, but instead a neural brain graft. Annie's work will allow this stroke victim to walk, talk, dance, and feel themselves again. We may also meet Carl, a man able, able to live out his life, not just with his great-grandkids, but his great-great-grandkids. Using neuromodulation and brain-computer interfacing, doctors are able to repair and create hybrid synapses curing his once inevitable Alzheimer's diagnosis. Unlike my own great-grandfather, Carl will be able to remember the names and faces of his family members as he lives his days out with them. We may meet a whole host of people in this future whose lives have been transformed by this technology. Arnold, blind for half his life, can now see the world around him via an electrode that bypasses a damaged optical nerve that uses extrasensor photodiodes and echolocation. Mayumi, who suffers from locked-in syndrome, can now communicate with her family members just by using her thoughts. Using electrodes in her brain, she's able to transmit information to electrodes in her mother's brain. Or Renee, who suffers from Parkinson's disease, is able to have full control over her muscles just by a simple device implanted in her brain. Or Ramesh, a once paraplegic, now uses those neural electrodes and brain-computer interfacing to control a whole robotic skeletal system, allowing him to walk again. Or my great-grandson, Brad Jr., is able to give his own TEDx presentation, not by speaking aloud, but by sharing his ideas and thoughts via a new neural cloud-based internet called the MindNet. These are only glimpses of what is possible. The rest, we must write together, for we are the authors of the future. And we must not only tell effective stories about science and technology, but choose to live them out to do so ethically and responsibly, and to create a future that everyone wants to participate in. And that will make it easier for society to accept those uncomfortable changes that revolutions bring. Because the next scientific revolutions can connect us more. They can help us see further. They can aid in new ways of understanding the complexities of nature. 
and help us live longer, healthier lives in a more interconnected and empathetic world. This all may seem disruptive to you, but the future will require a new strategy in how we work together to solve the grand challenges awaiting us. Because the alternative, not advancing our stories along with our science, is far more disruptive. Thank you.